Hello, um, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you today as a president of KCL Polish Society. Today's event is co-hosted with uh, LSC Polish Business Society and the Federation of Students, uh, Polish Student Societies in the UK. And our speaker today is Jacek Bartoszek. Um, Jacek is an expert on uh, geostrategy and modern, war uh, modern warfare and national security. Um, Jacek is a senior fellow at um, Potomac Foundation and uh, Director of uh, Wargaming Studies and Simulation at uh, Puaski Foundation. Um, he has been frequent contributor to Polish uh, and international media and print and broadcast media as well. Um, also, he has been an advisor to government and parliamentary bodies on geostrategic matters. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our second speaker, uh, the MP Daniel Kawczyński, won't be able to join us today. It's a last minute notice as he needs to be at the parliament for the voting on the EU withdrawal bill. But I'm certain that uh, Jacek Bartoszek will be um, basically handling the event himself and uh, will lead the discussion and answer all of your questions. So I will now pass over to Jacek Bartoszek. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And uh, I hope that he will not be disappointed that this is going to be a sort of a different format with only me and later all of us uh, discussing actively, uh, especially in QA sessions, which I like best. Uh, and uh, in absence of MP, uh, I hope that this will be a sort of a, in a more convenient uh, setting. So let me start by uh, taking off my jacket, okay? And because uh, <laughs> really, I prefer speaking like that. And let's let's get started. So I was asked by the um, the um, by by the nice uh, uh, friend uh, uh, to speak about uh, Brexit and its implication uh, its implications both on on England, on Great Britain, on the situation uh, of the people here in in, in UK, and uh, on Poland, and actually on what is going on exactly in Europe as we as we apparently see the fragmentation of the continent and the uh, fragmentation of the old system of the balance that has been uh, in existence at least since uh, the end of the Cold War and creation of the new system with uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So let me, uh, let me begin with, taking, with venturing into the old imperial past of uh, Great Britain and uh, I'll try to describe the world in, uh, uh, in which uh, Great Britain was an imperial power of co complete omnipotence and uh, in which this wealth and everything that you see on the streets of London was created. And uh, sometimes I suspect, especially when I deal with Brexit, that uh, the British uh, politicians, British elites still are somewhere there in this uh, imperial setting. Uh, I hope that maybe, you know, I'll draw some maps or whatever, some contours of maps and uh, try to explain. So basically, if we think in terms of geostrategy, and of course, if anybody's dealing with geostrategy, then this person is completely obsessed with geostrategy and that, that everything stems from geostrategy. Nothing else matters. So let me follow this script. Uh, but in order to justify myself, uh, the older I get and the more I know about the real politics, real politics, not the theater that you can see on TV, not the things that you read in the papers, uh, it's about geostrategy. And actually it's about geopolitics and geostrategy. And what is the difference? And we need to, 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 to say, we need to state what the difference is, as that will show us in what sort of world the politicians, the decision makers, the real leaders live. Geopolitics is reality. It's just objective reality. Where the center of wealth is. Where, where is the line of communication connecting me to the center of wealth and power from which I derive my power and my prosperity? How I sustain this, this line of communication? Uh, what is being shifting? Uh, what is going on that the center is moving somewhere else and I need to take a look at it? This is geopolitics. Geopolitics decides the fate 
of the disposition of power on the globe. It also it has the same bearing on the political life internally, but that's a, a different matter. So this is it. The problem is that it's not easy to to to, to see it. There there is no perfect man, no perfect geopolitician who can see in all details. If it, if this were a case, then everybody would be perfect, and all countries would run the best policy that they could have. The mistakes that are being made result from many factors. The, 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 the most frequent flaw is the mental map in which a given leader is living. And that's the case of Brexit, in my opinion, and I'll get back to it. If you live in the mental map, and your mental map is usually based on the history, on the examples of history, on, on how you were raised, on your behavior in the past, on your path to success, on your friends, on the, on the rumors, on the plotting, on your court around you as a leader, because people are plotting in the court, trying to, to tell you different things, just to have influence on you, and so on and so on. It's a, there is a lot of rubbish around you out of which you need to deduct what is the reality. Because everybody is constrained by the capability to estimate, evaluate your, the surroundings. That's why many mistakes are made. Many mistakes are made. And this sphere, this zone between objective reality of geopolitics and all this mental map, those flaws that are in between and the real decision that is being made, the geostrategic decision, is this gray zone in which those mistakes are made. And on the other hand, grand strategies are designed. Brilliant strategies that change, change the direction of the world. The brilliant, the brilliant decision that Great Britain, that England made, was deciding on uh, building a fleet and uh, challenging Spain and Portugal once the, the Atlantic Ocean uh, was opened by brave sailors in the 15th and the 16th uh, century. Uh, at that time, uh, England, from a remote, faraway place of no importance for the balance of power on the continent, for the prosperity on the continent, uh, as we remember, the Atlantic Ocean was the end of the world. Nothing was going on. That was supposed to be the end and the hell. Behind the pillars of uh, Heracles, nothing existed in old mental maps. Still, the sailors ventured to the sea, established the lines of communications, the new assets, to the new resources in the new world, around Africa, Indian Ocean, you know, we'll get back to, to it later. And then the decision makers in England, let's, let's put it that way, realized that geography, geography creates a unique opportunity for England to become a power, a really superpower in the future. As when you see the map, of the Western Peninsula of Eurasia, which is Europe. You can see that everything is related to the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean has two marginal seas, inland seas, Baltic Sea and the Mediterranean connected with the Black Sea. With so many peninsulas, with, so, with, with such a long coastal line of the Western Europe, who controls the water? around the perimeter of the European Peninsula is the master of this place. And moreover, who controls all the approaches and lines of communications to the new center of gravity? Because in the middle, in the ancient world, for many reasons, it was the Mediterranean that was a center of gravity, both shores, North Africa and, uh, and Southern Europe and Asia Minor, that was the uh, sort of a uh, world in which people lived. Then it moved behind the Alps 
to the estuary of Mosa and, and the Rhine rivers and uh, the new center of gravity of Europe for many reasons, mostly manpower and agricultural production was created. And who controlled the, the access to the northern European plain, to the northern countries, to the low countries, to Le, you know, Reich, yeah, to, the, to the Germany, controlled the fate and progress and prosperity of all the people in Europe. And that was this narrow strait between the northern Scotland, Iceland, and Norway. If you take a look at the map, it's a very short distance. The Shetland Islands are giving a protecting screen for any fleet operations that want to blockade any movement between the British Isles and Scandinavia. And Englishmen knew it. And they built a fleet. And they controlled the rules after many wars because they had to fight Portugal, Spain, they had to fight uh, Dutch, French, and so on and so forth. But they always controlled those seas. Who controlled those seas? Controlled the prosperity of those producing countries. Could set the rules, how you trade, what tariffs you have. And here let me remind of the old saying that I have, if someone watched Jimmy Obiecana, Promised Land, in Polish. How there was this theater scene that, you know, those three guys that wanted to build a factory in Poland, and then at that time, under the Russian uh, rule, uh, in the westernmost part of the country, they wanted to, 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 to build, uh, I think, a cotton or a linen factory. Uh, they said, okay, the British are imposed, they, they overheard the rumor. The British are imposing tariffs in Hamburg, so we need to sell in Odessa, something like that. So how come the British were imposing tariffs? Okay, they could impose the tariffs and influence the decision-making process because they ruled it. Because they, they always could threaten blockade. They controlled the rules. In times when the, when the railway was not existing and there were only roads and you had the Alps and the Carpathians in the middle of the peninsula. So you moved, if you were producing something in, in, in northern Germany, you moved your goods around Europe to the Danube estuary in the Black Sea to move it back to the south, to the south Germany. It was cheaper. That showed what sort of power the real sea power of Great Britain had on the European trade. After defeating France at Trafalgar, and then after opening Suez Canal in the 19th century, there was a southern flank of Great Britain vital for the permanent line of communication to the resources of the Indian Ocean and to the to Hong Kong, to Singapore, India, of course. Indian Ocean became a closed ocean with Australia, Eastern Africa ports, Aden, and India ports, and Singapore, Malacca Strait. It became a, a closed ocean of Great Britain, from which Great Britain could deduct resources, manpower. Great Britain having those two flanks facing Germany and low countries and facing Mediterranean up to, you know, you had bases, Gibraltar, Malta, Alexandria, Aden, and to the Indian Ocean. They controlled everything, what's going on around Europe. And if you want to study the pattern of m most of the wars in Europe, it was the pattern of the landlocked countries of the continental Europe trying to break through this ring of power of the sea empire of Great Britain. From that fact, Great Britain not only could open up and close up the markets inside the continent, creating a great financial surplus. I mean, that's why how London was created, the financial city. It could also create a situation where it became a main place to trade 
and to render financial services for trade. So they had, Great Britain had Europe, it had huge political balancing power on any rising power that would try to challenge the role of, of Great Britain in the, in the world system. And for the 300 years until the Second World War, there was a repeating cycle of behavior of Great Britain. Splendid isolation, and we are facing it now in Brexit. I'll get back to it later. Then there was a rising power on the continent, be it France twice, be it Spain a little bit, especially in the long countries, be it, be it Germany. Russia. So Great Britain had time because the distance and isolation from the continent provided provided the country with the strategic space and strategic time to ponder the moves. Poland didn't have this chance. Like I'll talk to I'll talk about it as well. Uh, so there was a splendid isolation where England had, sorry for saying England, Great Britain, let's not waste time on you know, making those uh, uh, distinctions so, so much, had always free hands in handling the continental policy. And there's, there is a tendency to behave like that because it's easier. We can always trade with the world system without commitments without friends on the continent. That when the rising power was challenging this structured system, Great Britain allied with someone else against it, and when the alliance was not enough, there was war. And on the same day, when the enemy was defeated, Great Britain switched, usually, because the, the, the continental victor, an ally of, of Great Britain, became too, too strong for Great Britain itself. So on the same day, Great Britain started supporting the, the loser. That was the case with Germany in the First World War and after the Versailles. There balance were many. Balance of power. Balance of, balance of power. Balance of power. Balance of power. That's the mentality of decision makers in London. Let's not have the illusion that this has changed because of the 70 years of the American-led world system, of which we will talk in a minute. Especially that the world that we live in is crumbling. So, instinctively, as in our, our own lives, we balance the challenges. Not only did the Britain have this continent suppressed or under control, but it created, this country created an imperial system of network based on the capability to project power by the Royal Navy almost everywhere. At its peak, it had America, Africa, India, uh, seaports of the, uh, of, the, of the Pacific coast of China, Australia, you name it, you name it. The Royal Navy provided power projection and projection capabilities and support, and with it went influence to close and open markets. That, in this way, Great Britain had a priv created a privileged trading system in which it flourished, in which Okay. in which it flourished because structurally it favored interest of Great Britain because having an empire it's all about imposing your interest on the weaker parties so and third and having said the first control of the trading system in Europe Privileged trading system with the colonies, expo exploitation of, of, of those, at the reasonable level so that they didn't die. And on top of that, Great Britain was producing things, okay? 
Great Britain had coal, had industry producing things, at least at the competitive level until the end of the 19th century. Steel industry, uh, of course, shipbuilding industry, a little bit earlier, the linen, you know, linen industry collapsed compared to, to other uh, to other systems, to, to other economies. The problem was that, as Mackinder used to say, that peace is not eternal, and the status quo is not eternal. Eternal, it always changes. It always, it never endures. It is under permanent stress. And if you are an imperial power and you have the royal navy, you, you seem to have everything. You control most of the globe. And British pound is also a currency. If so, you become, become lazy. Because you don't need to produce effectively as your ships will open up markets for you. And this is what started to have to happen in the late 19th century, especially German and American economies became more competitive in many, many spheres. And once the Br British realized that you know they couldn't sort of uh, compete in terms of the uh, organization of workforce, of you know you have your habits, and the habit makes you, makes you lazy or organized in a different way and suddenly you, you lose dynamics, suddenly you lose your drive and that's over. I think that's that you can, what you can see right now in, uh, as well. And it's very difficult to come back to the market. So they started reminding the partners all across the world, you know guys, I know the German stuff is great, but you know, at the end of the day, are you really you know, confident that they will be delivered it's our ships that ensure safe delivery. So you'd better trade with us. Although we are not so competitive. By the way, just draw your conclusions from what I'm saying to the current situation of the United States and China. And that was, according to what Mackinder said, that was the moment when one driver of the train accelerated and another driver, another train, didn't stop. And we were on a collision course. As at that time, it turned out that the free trade, free global trade, doesn't promote peace. Despite all idealistic assumptions that we all want to prosper, that we really want to live in peace, that we really want to trade. But the growing power of someone else that in the, in the long run will create structural disadvantage is create such tensions to the system that the system cannot survive. By the way, this is what we are witnessing these days as well. And that was the time when Great Britain decided to fight for its position and we had to, what wars, splendid isolation was gone after many, many, many governmental meetings, discussions, uh, Britain was so hesitant and reluctant to join any alliance. First, Great Britain started courting Germany. S wanted to establish a ratio of the navy so that still Great Britain had an upper hand, but Germany didn't want to succumb. They already fed the blood in the air. Their industri industry was more productive. Their manpower was stronger their demo demographics were stronger. They wanted to have the space, the breathing space. They didn't want to succumb to the rules. And the argument of the British at that time that, okay guys, but we have had peace. Since the since, uh, Vienna Treaty, we have had generally peace. There was no a major war of domination in Europe. The 
there is a, a pattern in history that rising power never, never succumbs until it's defeated or it wins. Like life, again. So, we had two world wars. With the end of the Second World War and decolonization process, and especially Suez War, the power of Great Britain was shattered. In terms of geopolitics, the real winner was the United States. It was the United States that inherited the empire, the sea-based empire of Great Britain. By the way, this is why many Germans during the Second World War were wondering why Great Britain is fighting in that way. Because the real winner was the third party, United States, of this war. Both Germany. Germany, of course, lost, was divided, but also Great Britain lost. Let's recall those days after 1945, what was going on here. Well, how the economy struggled. What, what sort of tensions in political life were showing up. What happened to the great empire? The privilege after 1945, the privilege trading system was obliterated. The new world system was created by the United States with the US dollar in the in Bretton Woods system and United States interest and structural advantage to all other players. US Navy, a dominant power in the seas. Great Britain, major decline, quickly, cascading into a you know, downfall. Great Britain couldn't compete with other economies on, on the continent, especially after Germany again started growing economically. And it didn't have the Royal Navy to support its interests. So it's, it lost all the, you know, the foundations of prosperity. Then joining the European Union came about. The markets, unified markets. And after many hesitations, London joined joined this this thing in a completely different position not as an imperial power not as a power actually as a satellite to the United States in terms of geostrategy Western Europe after 1945 oh, okay let two world wars marked the long path for Europe in the late 19th century, all powers of the world, until the 90s of the 19th century, comprised, were living in Europe. All decisions regarding the world were made in Europe. And after a long war of domination over the European peninsula, in 1945, who ruled Europe? The external continental power of Soviet Union, landlocked, Euroasiatic in its size, poor but powerful from the heartland, as Mackinder used to, to say. And on the other hand, the sea power of the United States, the offshore, yeah, the offspring of Great Britain, the former colony. Europe was gone. And the decisions on war and peace in that time were made in Washington and Moscow, not in London, not in Paris, Bonn, or, or Warsaw. So that was the cost that also Great Britain paid for wars. So in Great Britain, London lo joined European Union. Because it is true, it is true, there is something wrong with Europe. There is really something deeply wrong with Europe. Europe is divided as a continent into two parts, obviously, Western and Eastern. 
But it's not about civilization itself. It's about geography. Western Europe is a coastal area intersected with mountains, with valleys, with rivers. All rivers are long. They are on the flat plains. There are many seas that you, through which you get access to oceans, to the trading. So there are many places which might be a basis for a political entity. This is why Western Europe is sort of a, you know, a mosaic of place of political, in the past especially, of political worlds, languages, dialects, ambitions. In such a dynamic and congested place as Europe, because Europe is small, there was a high competition. Once the Roman Empire was gone and there was no centralizing force, imperial force to centralize Europe, it was fighting for many centuries. How many wars Great Britain fought on the continent in a changing setting? How many wars with France and how many times on the same side as France? <laughs> how about Spain, the same, Portugal, other, play, you know, other, other players? So, Western, so there, and Eastern Europe is different. It's a land bridge between this western, westernmost peninsula, coastal area, and Eurasia. Poland is located in this place, connect, in the connection, in the corridor between the vast open areas, easy for maneuvering of troops, for concentrating of manpower, of uh, directing the economy in a centralized way, uh, for centralizing power, for subduing others and on the corridor to Western Europe. Mackinder used to call it, you know, the, the beginning of heartland, depending on who controls the Baltic Sea and whether land power can close the Baltic Sea and Danish Straits, then it becomes heartland, unsusceptible to the influence of the sea power. We'll talk at all about Poland a bit later. So, when, and we had this European dream. After the Second World War, people, leaders, realized that either it will be united or it will be either subdued by Soviet Union or United States. And that was a very sad end of the imperial past of European powers, wasn't it? And everything, you know, it seemed okay. Marshall Plan, Americans exported here, they wanted to have a healthy market, so they did it, they helped, they, they provided troops. Uh, Western Europe was and still is a dependency of the United States, it's a sort of a colony in terms of just strategy, because it's the US troops that provide security here. It's an illusion that there are no threats, okay? It's, there, it's an illusion, because nobody wants to challenge them the master, yet, yet. That's why European projects seem to be perfect. And it worked fine until the moment, again, and Mackinder was right again, that it's not about feeling fun, and it's not about prospering, it's about the unequal distribution of wealth and power and productivity. And again, it turned out that Germany, after being united, is a superior power on the European Peninsula. And if you're a superior power, apparently you want to impose your rules and you want to favor your interests. If you can challenge the rising power, you ally, but in, turn, but in the case of Great Britain, Great Britain tends to withdraw behind the English Channel to look around for opportunities, to have the free hands to see what's going on. We've always been a trading nation. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Was it, it wasn't bad. No? The problem is that times change. I said, no Royal Navy, no privileged trading system, no colonies, no 
real influence on the continent. And now, it's not the Northern Atlantic that is the center of communication and gravity close to the shores of UK, but it's the Pacific that has, is becoming this place. So, in terms of geopolitics, it seems to me that there is a, at least hugely uncharted waters that the government of Great Britain is sailing in. Because you need to have assets and resources from which you prosper. If Great Britain is outside of the continental market, so how can London financial services flourish? If the rules will be decided in Berlin, they will not be stupid. In the long run, they will create the settings for their places to flourish. It's a dangerous game for Poland, by the way. The European content will become more continental towards Russia and China and other places. I also think that instinctively the, Russian, the British uh, politicians are thinking about all good days when the seafaring people of United States and Great Britain created a big alliance and you know, dominate the world and maybe, okay, maybe, it's a nice bet. But if you don't have the force to open the markets in Europe, you don't have the industry that is competitive, you don't have too many arguments. For the United States also, you become less important. Because, and I need to say a few sentences, two words about that. Great Britain, after the Second World War, was a proxy of the United States here in Europe. It was a sort of an agent through which the U.S. power could influence the balance of power in Europe. Because the United States, as a remote maritime, a sea power, also balances the whole Eurasia from both sides of, of, the, of the oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic, to keep the balance that would favor the U.S. interests as a world system organizer and arbitrator. At least it seems so far that, that's, that that is the world that, in my opinion, is ending. That's another subject. But uh, I wonder what sort of role Great Britain could take if it really breaks it. Because for the United States, it loses its handiness, yeah, that's the word, handiness in balancing Eurasia. The United States may choose Poland then, by the way, because we are still on the continent and we can really balance the power as an organizing concept of intermarium and stuff. And this is what it's being whispered to our ears in Washington, by the way. That Brexit even facilitates our cooperation. I'm not saying if it's real and true, but that's an argument. So also you lose a leverage on the United States by doing Brexit. Okay, maybe the assumption is that China will become a main trading uh, world power and that London will be like a springboard, like a podium from which you, you jump into the swimming pool yeah, of, of the market with Chinese money, with Chinese investment. Maybe, 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 given the past record of you know, great uh, skills of, 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 of the financial world, maybe, maybe that's the assumption. But I doubt it, because you... you in the long term, you would need, you would have to choose between the sea power of the United States that would not be happy about it, a continental game around Berlin that wants to consolidate its power, including also financial aspects, and China, China's uh, grand uh, design. It's a very di uh, difficult game, and for the first time of the European history the game when we are the subject, especially the Britain is the subject of the game and not a influencer. It was the British ships 
that were imposing rules in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and other places. Right. Now, who knows what's going to happen. So, for, forgive me for grim prospects, but my opinion in terms of my perception of, 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 of geo, you know, this difference between geopolitics and, and geostrategy, it's a mistake. Great Britain doesn't have that leverage anymore uh, to return to the golden age of uh, its imperial past. And the uh, world system is changing, is moving toward the Pacific. And that will, of course, influence all Europe, but primarily Great Britain. And I don't know what the future of, of London will be in that respect as well. As regards, of course, uh, let me talk a bit about Poland and we'll have Q&A and I like Q&A because that will, the qu particular questions will open uh, up issues, yeah, we will be discussing issues uh, in the more Speaking uh, of uh, Poland, okay, we are in an even grimmer situation <laughs> because still, despite what I just said about how Britain is failing, it is across the channel. It is not interlocked in those tensions on the continent. And by the way, if someone thinks, and there is a tendency, especially in, 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 in the Western science, some parts of it, indeed, to denounce geostrategy and geopolitics, that geography doesn't matter anymore because you can concentrate your power in any places of the world, in the times of airlines, of uh, aircraft, uh, outer space, internet, so then you can accumulate your power and use it at anywhere you want, and there is one pool of system, and geography doesn't provide constraints, it's not true. In military strategies, it's bluntly untrue. I mean, it's even difficult to, to discuss it in terms of the policy making as well. Take a look at the security situation of Poland. How you project power. Where is the United States? How difficult it is to project power. Your influence doesn't reach if you don't have military or money. Yeah. And the, the further it is from your center, from your core, the less interested you are, it's obvious. Usually, neighboring countries are trading most. And many more, many more. Internet is also dependent upon the host of the internet. It's still the power of a particular country that is cited. It's an illusion. Freedom of navigation, seafaring, is also an illusion based on the fact that it's the United States Navy that is making it happen. If it's gone, we will have the balkanization of the system. That was the same with the Royal Navy. This is why we have lived for 200 years with this habit of having a freedom of navigation because sea powers profited structurally from the flow and volumes. Bark, 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 and the financing, you have the currency, and so on, so on. It's an illusion. Of course, there is an, also an illusion of possibility to influence all decisions everywhere. Countries balance against the threats that are close, not far. Okay? We don't give a damn about Venezuela. I don't give a damn. It doesn't have any sort of impact on my country. I don't even care too much about the Panama Canal. Too much. Maybe only because I, I you know, I was happy about the U.S.-led world system, yeah? So, pa uh, Panama Canal is sort of augmenting the U.S. power, so let's, let's, let's state like it is. But I don't care much about the United States cares, and other countries care. And uh, so proximity and distance creates different tensions. So there is still geopolitics, geostrategy. Moreover, Moreover, the more we trade, the quicker we communicate. 
the faster we meet, the faster we commute, the more congested the conflicting zone of interest becomes, the more intertwined interests are. If Eurasia is going to become the one big trading thing that Chinese are predicting under Belton Road Initiative, New South Road Initiative. So imagine what sort of tensions in this landlocked, a little bit even claustrophobic environment it will have. There will be no strategic space to retreat. I need to make business here. If I don't make the business here, someone will make it and it will be stronger in the long run. So I have to compete and so, 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 uh, and so on. Especially if someone lives in London. And honestly, think about his or her mental map. You will notice that if you look at the world map, you see you, your point of views of a seaman's perspective. What you see is the coastal lines with a few, with a few important markets inside along the Eurasian rimland. And what you will see is the line of, lines of communication, the rules that govern. Who cares about Kazakhstan in London? About Iran, and I'm not talking about nuclear thing, but trading. About Central Asia, about the Caspian Sea. Who knows where those places are? Yeah, but people mostly know where the Suez Canal is, where Malacca Strait is. Yeah, it's and if Eurasia becomes a one trading system, the, all of those forgotten places, landlocked places, will become a shine, not a shine, but like at least a new lights where the business is made, where things are happening. That will create new sources of power, new patterns of distribution of power. Someone will lose, someone will win. We're entering this era, but at that time, Great Britain will be at the disadvantage position as a Atlantic-based island, not in the continental market, in the, uh, in the old system, without all old advantages. So that's, uh, that is the picture. And when I, speaking about Poland, Poland is exactly located between the sea and the land in that respect. Between the source of the distribution of power concentrated about the element, the sea power of United States, Great Britain, US-led world system, NATO, Bretton Woods. Geographically, it's close to the rising, challenging powers of Russia and China on the other side of Eurasia. With all the land corridors going through Poland, whatever the way, on the north, south, east, west, crossroads in continental Europe, and if you take a look at Eurasia and how mountains are located and rivers flow, again, on the crossroads. That's why we can't be dormant. We just can't sleep and say, okay, we'll see what happens. We need to attentively see what is going on. Whether the old world system based on the sea power of the United States will prevail whether Donald Trump will convince the Asian allies to create a new trading system, fair, as he said, trading system with him, or he's going to lose, and the world will come into a new stage. Or we need to attentively see two developments in the land, in Turkey, Kazakhstan, Iran, the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea surrounding. 
because that's the place that will grow in significance in the coming decades. Infrastructure, communication lines, and who will profit from that, who will lose from that, will decide the future of Poland. Poland is also facing a geostrategic decision. The UK made this decision by Brexit, and I understand that it, it is following on with this decision. We'll see at the end of the day how it will end. But Poland is also now on the verge of the decision. There are three options. One option is to accept the offer that is on the table from Germany to create the continental trading system based around Germany under this new formula of EU, whatever you call it. Basically, it's Germany and surroundings. It, will, it could be convenient for Poland. We trade with Germany, we prosper, we have the growth. Germany doesn't have military yet. We make money. We have the peace. And it's on the table. It's a very strong factor in the Polish policy, the internal policy. There is another option. In my personal opinion, right now, favored by decision makers, is to create, I call it an sort of an old imperial vision of intermarium. That means creating an organizing concept given, it's true, by nature and geography, of which I will say a few words in a minute, and create a balancing organizing concept in Central and Eastern Europe against Germany and continental consolidating bloc and against weakening power of Russia, supported by the sea power of the United States and potentially Great Britain. And that is the idea that is very deep in the hearts of the old Polish elites that used to be before the Second World War, for the First World War, and now, now it is again. It, I have lectures in Brussels, now I am having a lecture in London, and I can understand it may sound funny to Westerners to hear that, that such designs are in the Polish hands, but they are. They simply are. We don't see that the future is in Brussels or in Berlin. This world is in decline. And I had a lecture in Brussels and really, you know, the audience sort of found it ridiculous. But I'm telling you, in Warsaw, it's the other way around when, when you have lectures. So, it, but it's a, it's a nice sort of uh, also experience. This difference between geopolitics and geostrategy, yeah? how you feel the reality, whether you're completely at uh, dysfunction with reality or not. And the reason why, rightly, the Westerners, right, on surface, rightly, the Westerners are or people at least based in London and Brussels are making fun of this idea that Poland might be Poland, Intermarium, Ukraine, Romania, all those countries, all the belt of countries between the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea might be an organizing concept supported by the United States, is a funny joke, is uh, they just uh, uh, feel it because it's about money and GDP and so on. And it's really, Poland is like a, you know, a dwarf, yeah? compared to the content of you to Germany. But the problem is, and that's a huge challenge for Poland, is that it is this damn geography that creates this necessity to think about this grand design. Because we cannot survive if there is no world system, a league of nations, 
in the United Nations supported by US uh, prevailing power. We need to survive between consolidating Germany and Russia. And historically, we could never survive. And it's not about the war. It's not about fighting. It's about a capability to impose our own rules on our economy, how we want to live, how we want to regulate the economy, with whom we want to trade, where we want to have the markets. If you are in the game of the balance of power, if you are inferior in the assets, military assets, economy assets, you don't have the real tools to create policy. So you, be, in time, you become dependent upon decision-making process of your neighbor. It's a zero-sum game, and there is no illusion about it. Unless there is one arbitrator, Roman Empire, you know, over provinces, United States, and the Bretton Woods-led system that is crumbling, then you need, in order to run your own policy, you need to have arguments. And now, because Poland doesn't want to, to be led by Germany, because it's our neighbor and we don't want to be like that, we need to challenge geography. I mean, we need to follow geography. And by paradox, geography creates an organizing concept for Intermarium. It's true. The belt of countries between the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea create, creates uh, the proper defensive perimeter for our military. Forward, forward uh, projecting perimeter. It creates enough and sufficient manpower and economy to balance Russia and later on Germany. And history proved it. It creates a buffer zone for the sea power to, of Great Britain in the past and now United States to influence situation in the continental Europe. So it's a very handy tool for the US now. So organi organically we have an ally that will help. Okay, the level of help, the scope of help is to be discussed, but that's how in Washington it's being conceptualized. So this is the second option that Poland has had, and mark my words, watch Polish TV, listen to you know, here and there papers, what they say, and you will see what's going on. And the third concept is an attempt to create a new a new uh, game, and this is the most difficult. And I'm talking about the third concept because there is a new factor that has never been, um, okay, that has never been really, really present in Europe. And the factor is that for the first time in history, or at least after the Mongols, <laughs> Mongols arrived here, not here, but in, in continental Europe. There is a, a beyond European superpower that it starts having influence in European matters and in China. Because from the Chinese perspective, Poland is a main bridge of access to the Western Europe. It's a main balancing country against any challenges to Belt and Road. And geography makes Poland the perfect place to anchor the terminal end of the land Belt and Road Initiative. So whether we want it, Poles want it or not, we will be calculated in the new balance of game, balance of power game in Eurasia. Even if we say, no, we don't care, we just want to, to live. And this third option would require a balanced approach and a really smart thinking, as it has to destroy a lot of men, old mental maps and play one, one against others, and it might be not doable. Because you need to remember that it's not the theoretical talk that I'm having. Real politics is made through people. They are treated like vessels in the body, okay, through which blood, influence, money, ideas are flowing. So there are dependencies, 
their interests, their vested interests, connecting people and whole groups of people, I mean, miners, sailors, steel industry, particular party, city dwellers, with this source of power and with another one outside of you know, the country. For example, in London, if you make a poll in the, among the bankers in London, I think they would want to, to stay in, uh, in you. Right? They understand it. And it's not about the reason. It's about the interests. And they understand how the communication of interest has developed. So they become the status quo force that drive the policy back to the continental Europe. There is another group of people, and I'm not an expert in the internal policy of Great Britain, but for sure you will map such place. And the same with other countries, including Poland. There are also groups of politicians with their mental maps that are this way or another connected to old or new centers of power in terms of geostrategy. And that's how the real politics is being made. It's not about talking on, on, on the shows and something. This is how real decisions are being imposed and forced in real everyday policy making in the government. So maybe uh, I lost track of my time. Maybe la let me pause here and if there are maybe let's go to questions and answers phase. <clears throat> Thank you for an excellent speech as always. Um, you've mentioned two things. You've said that Britain, the United Kingdom, was, after the Second World War, a bit of a proxy of the United States, turning into more of a partner, uh, uh, an ally of the, a strong ally of the United States, as it is today, and that because of Brexit, Poland somehow may take over that role or some sort of a similar role of a representative of the United States or uh, a similar voice uh, to the United States. And uh, you've also mentioned that Poland can be creating that new alliance, that new power of intermarium, uh, which could be perceived as slightly anti-German because of the current German dominance uh, in, in Europe. But there is, a very there is an increasing heavy criticism of, of Poland today from Germany and from the uh, European Parliament uh, of certain changes that are, that are going on in Poland. And uh, Poland has become even closer to the United States at the sort of late uh, phase of the former government and currently with, with this government, which is very strongly uh, pro-US. This criticism, as many of us have, may have heard to, uh, today in the European Parliament, Poland is criticized for a, for a number of issues, abortion, judicial changes, euthanasia, um, while some other countries in Europe are not as heavily criticized. For example, Spain, which is, there are some serious issues going on in, in that country as well. Would you be able to say that the current criticism of Poland is linked to those possibilities of Poland becoming not sort of going with the flow of the European Union but heading towards more cooperation with the United States and possibly creating that new entity of intermarium or is it really that there are some bad things happening in Poland and Poland is criticized because of moral issues and some judicial issues or do you think Germany and some other powers in the EU are really concerned with with these new geopolitical changes that are occurring now and that you have spoken about? Okay, let me answer your first question first. Uh, what I said was not that US 
is perceiving Poland as a new Great Britain, but in the landlocked uh, setting and environment in, in Europe. But some people in Warsaw think that this could be the case, okay? And that's a huge difference, okay? I think that this is, again, this, this uh, distinction between geopolitics and geostrategy, yeah? You know, you, that's exactly the place where you can make mistakes, yeah? I think that will never be the same because Great Britain is still an offshore island from which you project power into Europe. It's irreplaceable <laughs> because of geography. They can choose us, they can abandon us, but Great Britain is re irreplaceable. That's my opinion. And that's why uh, uh, this is one of the flaws of thinking over ambitious. <laughs> Answering the second question, that's exactly what I said during my speech, during my lecture. It's about... Uh, this is exactly how you cut the geopolitical strings. And about all those moral things, it's like, like you know, empty talk. Nicholas Spiteman, who is the foremost American... who was the fo foremost American strategist, <laughs> And a legend. It's a man, if you talk to any American decision maker, in the military or a civilian, created the geostrategic thinking of the United States during the Second World War. He's like, a, you know, Abraham, okay? With all proportions, you know, contained. He said that the leader, political leader, all he has to do is to expand his power. And the power is capability to achieve results you want to achieve by convincing other people of whatever the method takes. And that's the real power. And it's about the real power that politics is about. And it's about the real power that politicians are destined to fight for. If the moral issues, other issues you mentioned, are on the contradictory course, or are declining the expansion of power, you need to abandon it. And it sounds devilish, but you know what? Spikeman explained later that if all the players in the game, in the politics, political or politicians, behave like that, they are predictable, and the system is balancing itself, creates a setting for peace. You understand? So there is something devilish about it, and there is some truth about it, especially if you get older and older and older and older. But it doesn't matter what I think. It matters that Americans are following like Nicholas Spikeman. Okay? And this is also the nature of power. If the European Union accepted Poland already many years ago, it was like in the past life, yeah? And it, we were a third tier, tier country, okay, with no income, desperate and happy to join the beautiful world of the West. We accepted the third tier status. And they were happy. We opened up market. Berlin was happy, close to the borders. They could, you know, their capital was flowing in, buying everything. Brussels was happy. People in Brussels were happy. You know, they get connection to another, you know, player, to another market, to another place where the empire could expand. With time, the empire usually creates a network of, of money flowing, of people, of, of course, there, there must be also an overriding principle. There were, principle in Roman, there were principles in Roman empire that were overriding Roman law yeah, that had to be uh, obey. In uh, the American world empire, it's the uh, openness of markets and acceptance of the U.S. dollar system. In the Brussels system, it's the re regulatory economy creating advantages for the old economies of Western continental Europe. Okay, and as long as you obey, you're fine, and you're happy, and you're a good boy. 
if you suddenly realize that you have your own interests, you have coal, you have other access, and you have other markets, and you compete on other markets with Germany and France, then you start your own game of a mature person. But they don't want you to mature. They want you to listen. They want you to be a market. So they start to impose their soft power. Because power is divided, according to Joseph Nye, into hard power and soft power. Hard power is war. Sometimes it took war to impose the rules. Remember Saddam Hussein? I'm not talking about medieval ages. It's, and the, the, another hard power tool is sanctions. Excluding someone from trading from the system where I rule, I'm a judge, get out. United States often does it. Not only war, but also excluding things. Who gets into a world trade system? Who gets out? Who is being uh, sanctioned? Who is not? They even threaten China now, the main industrial power of the world. It's hard power. And the threat to use it is a really hard power. It's a, it creates a leverage on your interest. Then you need to subdue your interest because in fear of war, that's why you create your own military to counter it, okay? Or you, you want to have your economy flourishing so that nobody can have leverage on you and, and impose the will. Or you, have, you can have soft power. We talk about soft power now. Soft power is technology, financial aid, the, the way that things are supported, and of course the reputation, culture, and stuff. So they are using the soft power methods to force Poles and others to behave in a polite way, as the center in Brussels and in Berlin want Poland to behave. And here I'm not talking if it's good or bad, let me be straight. I told you that this is a legitimate proposal to join the continental trading bloc for Poland. I'm not talking about moral values. I'm talking about reality. That's how they want to impose. So it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong in terms of power politics. Who is imposing, whether really there is some reform in Poland, there is no reform in Poland. It's important for the people, for people sitting here. But in terms of the who imposing the rules in the long run and who has advantages in the system, it doesn't matter. It's only a soft power game. And Poland now decided that we don't give a damn because, guys, you don't have the hard power. You, don't, you, can't, you can't provide... You don't have the military. German military is weaker than Polish. You can't uh, impose sanctions on us because you are facing sanctions from U.S., by the way. And we don't want your military because NATO is basically sort of out of date and it's only about US and the coalition of willing that helps us. So there is no leverage on the Polish interest that the Western uh, continental Europeans have except for funds from EU that are ending in the new perspective. It's real politics. Other things are just like, you know, uh, fog of war. I, I think that's the term in English. I hope that I've helped you know, answer it. You know, I'm, I'm also geopolitic, I'm geopolitician, so for me it looks like that. Yeah, it, it's of lesser relevance from, from that perspective, power, power game, what's really going on. They are using the soft power tools that they have in Poland to impose the will, yeah? But the decision maker center in Poland decide that we don't give it them. Next question. about the region of uh, Europe. Uh, we talk about liberal democracies of the West, and uh, we can take say there is something really going wrong with these democracies. And uh, we can see that through the rising inequalities, both in the case of the uh, social side, the economic side, and especially the political side, as it ceases to be the fact that people decide, but it's more the elites who start to decide. And um, looking at Everything that's going on in Europe and in the world, we can clearly see the rise of radical democracy. We can see that through the British referendum, where, let's say, the majority decided and the political elite follows that. We see that through the US, where the politicians 
politician who actually uh, fulfills the wishes of the people who becomes the president. And we see that through Poland, where, where again, a party fulfilling the wishes of the people starts through and uh, does everything that people actually want it to. And the, my question is, where are we now with regards to radical democracy? Is it going to become a dominant way of ruling uh, nations, not only in these countries I mentioned, but also in countries of Western Europe? And what is the role of the EU in all of that? An institution that is very far away from any kind of democracy, which is a bureaucratic institution, suddenly faced with the wishes of the people. Brilliant question, and of course I have no answer. <laughs> I have no idea what will happen to the liberal democracy. I think we are entering, as I said, we are entering the uncharted waters. All I can say is my old personal and probably flawed mental map that I use uh, is that uh, liberal democracy is characteristic of the sea power trading nations with open markets. That's, uh, that's why, that's, th therefore the history of the liberal democracy is, was shaped by, by uh, Anglo-Saxon world and uh, sea-oriented people that trade, that have open ports, that uh, the more, you know, the more you, you exchange, the more you communicate, the better for everybody and it's prosperity and the, the, the assets are completely, you know, never end. <coughs> In landlocked countries, it's not the case, it's a different uh, power distribution concept. That's why it's so difficult to, 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 to say. And plus, there is a lot about etiquette about it, you know. Someone wants to judge what is more radical, what is more liberal. I think also that we have lived in the face of the world system uh, that the uh, United States <coughs> has supported uh, since the Second World War. It was convenient and advantages for the United States to promote liberal democracy as it provided for opening up markets for American, first American products, goods, and rule of law that protected interests pro pro properly. And there were no artificial barriers yeah, for opening up markets and getting, uh, getting the, uh, the, the access to the markets. So for the dominant sea power that profits from the volume of exchange, the world system is great as long as it is an arbitrator. What I, I'm saying, but I'm not an expert, is uh, in, 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 in what I see in Brexit and in other places, uh, in Brexit in, in UK and in, in other places in the, in the world where we see that there is some sort of a wave of anti-establishment movement. And my personal opinion is the result of globalization. I think that in the United States, Donald Trump won the election. And he really won, okay? He really won the election, but in terms of what the system looked like, it doesn't matter how many votes, the system looked like, and he really won. Let's put it straight. There's always some system in which you need to prevail, and he prevailed in the system. Amer Americans enter the same path as Great Britain entered in the 19th century. Too nice, too big a navy, too easy. And China is producing everything. But we control all the controls. Yeah? But China is not at the show. They outsmarted the West and the United States. Gene is out of the bottle. The game is over. And the show is ending quickly. And Trump is a phenomenon. The last call of the US sea base power to restore the status quo situation. 
with all those attempts to restore the productivity, industrial base, uh, you know, uh, one-on-one trading systems, American military punch, and so on. In my opinion, it is sort of late, and that's why it's dangerous. Diagnosis was right, remedy is a little bit too, mal- too, too, too dangerous. With Great Britain the same. Something went wrong. Something went wrong, there was no representation. Things, stratification of, of income <laughs> became too large. System stopped work. Stopped work. Globalization benefited people living in big cities, near to the coast, to the ports. Nice, nice guys, nice, nice, nice people, but not everybody. Not middle class, not hardworking people that really create stuff. Hi, I have two questions, uh, which are very different. The first one, uh, you said Poland is in the middle, so do you find it it is included in both sides or rather excluded? And uh, the second question, we had this Operation Zapad a couple of months ago. What did it? What do you think it said after those couple of months uh, have passed? Uh, by uh, Poland being in the middle between the land and the sea, eh? yeah. No, exactly. Um, that's. I'm writing a book about it, so <laughs> I'm trying to be really, you know, brief on that. In many aspects, we are between the land and the sea. We are anchored in secure system now, NATO and US, based on the sea. Yeah? We end. That's the first factor. We have entered. We we did enter in the past. The world system under Balcerowicz based on the US-led system, sea-based Bretton Woods system. Okay, that's another fact. And we did well. We, in the past, we were the empire. Poland was an empire. Intermarium, Commonwealth was an empire. Once it was in the land world system, not in the sea world system. The Sea World system was created after Columbus set the sail and conquered, followed by others, and then this sea-based system was created w- with a detriment to Poland. The reason, guys, why most of you study here is this factor, that uh, you should blame Christopher Columbus for that. <laughs> really, you should blame him for that. Uh, because before him it was Constantinople that was a major place to live probably you would you would go there to study uh, maybe Baghdad who knows but those sailors created a system which produced money and capitalism and manufacturing and social changes that uh, on the flip side, petrified the old feudal system in Poland and for the, the next 400 years created a structure where you couldn't sort of uh, compete properly so people were fleeing Poland just for a better life or were fleeing for more to have security for both reasons. Every single generation since uh, grand uh, wars with Sweden in the, in the 17th century. Uh, the feudal system petrified the rising system of you know advances of prosperity so people were just leaving for, for money and for having a career security security so the reason why London has better money better universities and better access to real science and English is a language spoken by trading people which means by world is because of this fact that there uh, were great discoveries and those sailors were brave enough to, to enter the uncharted waters of the new world. Uh, and uh, historically, we were better off in the uh, land system. Moreover, historically, under the Russian rule, the western provinces of the Russian Empire, Polish-speaking provinces, were the richest 
and we're prospering most. Jimmy Abitsana again is proving this this fact. So, because then you have markets, the whole Eurasian market is yours, and you are the most competitive. You don't need to compete with Berlin, you don't care. You have all the way to the Pacific, Central Asia, as your marketplace. And this is what the Chinese are saying. That's the time, guys. For all of you that were out of the game when those sailors dominated the world and created the system, when a few rich Western powers, seafaring countries, controlled and dominate the system and they prosper, you get poorer. That's the message that they provide, not to us, but also to, the, to Pakistan, to Asia, Central Asia, Iran, all those places that remember. Remember old times of, you know, Roman Empire and uh, old times of the, uh, before the discoveries. Where was the half of the world? Persian Gulf, trading system from China to the Roman Empire. Peter Frankopan wrote an excellent book about it. That was a, the place uh, that uh, created uh, money. And that's why Constantinople was located where it's located. Uh, so we are in the middle. This is why our kings in the Middle Ages were trying to seize access to the Black Sea. That was a access to, to, to gain access to the Arab world real money was there, and uh, Byzantium. And that's why we fought wars on the over estuary of the Danube River and the Dniester River to the Black Sea. This is why trading stations and the uh, cities were located by Kashmir the Great, just to be connected to the system of trading. And if you're connected both to the Black Sea and the Black Baltic Sea, then you're connected both to the Pacific and to the Atlantic. And the United Kingdom doesn't have it. So we are in the middle. And uh, at the same time, the huge continental scale Russian Empire was killing us, was depriving us of independence, of culture, of our own decision making, of everything. So you see what a paradox it is, yeah? It's a game to be played. Especially that Russia is in decline. It's in the decline uncomparable to anything since Peter the Great, since the times before Peter, prior to Peter the Great. <coughs> Who knows what is going to happen and China is in, on the rise. And it's palpable, its influence is palpable in Central and Eastern Europe, trust me. Probably not here in London, but you can see it behind the Elbe River. So we'll see what sort of world we will have. That's why we are squeezed between the land and the sea, both the security aspects and the economy, plus the transportation network that favors the development of Poland is not convenient for the Western continental power. Because if you are Germany or France, you just want to have access to Russia. So what you need is a sort of a roads like that, connecting through Poland. But if you're Poland, you don't only need those access, those highways and railways, but most, most of all, you need to connect north and south to the Black Sea, to Mediterranean, to the Indian Ocean, to the Caspian Sea, to the land aspect, into Scandinavia and to the Atlantic Ocean, north and south, uncontrolled by Germany. And guess whether the bureaucrats will help us build the infrastructure we want. And this is how you make geostrategic decisions. Another question. Uh, so, yeah, first of all, I'm very pleased to see you live. Uh, thank you for being on them. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, so the first question is, what could be the short-term and long-term effects of Brexit? on Great Britain as well as as well as on the um, continental Europe. And the second question is um, 
What do you think, what are the chances that the United States and China will escape the Tukidides trap? First question is very difficult, the second one is easier. Okay. Sadly. The first is very difficult. I think there are many companies and persons happy, uh, in Germany, happy about Brexit. Okay. I think that uh, if Brexit really happens, uh, that will end, uh, you know, the world is not in shatters. The Germany will orient itself towards the Eastern markets, connecting with China, with the Arab world, with the Levant, with Russia. And it's the German capital, the German enterprises will drive this, will drive the politi politicians. Germany is divided. Those guys lost two wars, okay? From the hands of the seafaring people. They remember. Really, they, they lost. The politicians remember that whenever Germany wanted to escape the enclosure by seafaring people and get out to the open and go its own way, there was war. That's why after the after 1945, the Germans accepted the pro-Atlantic posture. And it's a principle of faith in Berlin. But I'm, I'm sure that in the corridors, in the Siemens headquarters, in other places, they dream about incomes and yields and cooperation with Poland, with the Danube Valley, Valley countries with the, this cheap labor, with this access for German companies, the natural resources, natural markets. They dream about opening mar up markets in the continental uh, Eurasia. Because they all, they've been always dreaming of that. And it's not about thinking, it's about real money making. This is where they make bigger money than somewhere else, potentially. And those markets are not developed. They, they need German machinery. They really need it, yes? And it's palpable. So that's why Alternative für Deutschland is, is having this uh, sort of, you know, election uh, results, because they are saying about the, comp in terms of geopolitics, and I listened to them a few times, and they think about geopolitics, and the old style, Haushofer style, about continental gain. That's why they, they, they don't want Ukraine to be, you know, a, a hot place. They want peace in the East. And they want Russia to be a partner. And it's not in the interest of, of Poland and the United States. So if this tendency, if the continental Europe consolidates around Germany, we will have a reversal of the consequences of the Second World War. Because the reason why the war was fought was for the Germany not to dominate continental Europe. And it's on the way to dominate continental Europe with Brexit. That's why... You Americans were so unhappy, let's put it that way, about Brexit. You heard it on, on TV, right? Because the, in this way, guys, we are losing the war that we were fighting already. Yeah. In, in the geopolitical set, mind, mindset, that's, that's it. And speaking about so see this trap in China and the United States, I'm becoming more and more pessimistic especially after Donald Trump visited Asia. Uh, <coughs> I don't know. I really don't know. It will depend whether the United States will really manage to group those countries and then the alliance cons containing China. I don't know. Everything is possible. China is very powerful. And they are bent on driving it. Let's change. They are really bent on it. It's trade wars in the air. You know, I I, I don't I don't want to to get into details on that, but uh, it's really a huge 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 uh, thing. 
I just what, what I wanted to say, and I, I think I've said a few times during my lectures recently, is that there is this famous book, probably it's also famous in, in London, of uh, by Graham Allison. So it was published in June in New York City or in Boston. U.S. and China: The Sin for War. It's a bestseller in the U.S. Okay. It's about Lucy the Trap. Graham Allison is having a lot of speeches now, interviews with Kissinger, with Kaplan, with with uh, Ferguson, with other guys, with also ex-American military uh, generals. And in this book, Graham Allison is providing such data on what the rise of China really means that they are overwhelmed. I would recommend, I would recommend reading it. One data that is really one one set of data that is really that is really uh, compelling. In 1942 or 1943, both Nazi Germany and Japan combined had a GDP of 39 percent of the U.S. GDP at that time in nominal value. China, two, year, two years ago, two years ago, and the guys are growing, had the nominal GDP of 60% of the United States. And they are growing faster than the United States. And in PPP, they are bigger. Never in the history of the domination of the United States Americans have faced such a competitor. Never. Un it's uncomparable in scale. On top of that, China is in the middle of the sea-based world system created by the United States. They got in the middle of that, and both Japan or Germany didn't have this place, not to mention Soviet Union. And during those, the Second World War, United States, I forgot to say it, had on its side Soviet Union, huge continental power, and the United Kingdom with a privileged trade war, uh, colonial system. I don't know how the U.S. is going to, uh, to face this challenge, uh, given the fact that they have been a uh, ruling power for so long, and they have a moral feeling, and I noticed that. that and it's true. They created a balanced world system where a majority, majority of people really prosper. In the American stable world system, with some wars on the periphery, a lot of nations were lifted out of the poverty, including China. So America will have a strong argument uh, to fight internally. I don't know. I actually know you know that I wrote a book about the war, the coming war, so I don't want to, to say it's going to happen, but Trump's policy is making it more probable, and China is winning. He might run this policy a bit smarter, in my opinion, but his diagnosis was right, that it has, things have to change can't be like that. Another question. Thank you. I, I was hoping to follow up on one of the points which was briefly touched upon earlier, so globalization. So one may think that it's slightly bit ironic that it's China being currently the most eager proponents of the global liberal uh, economic order. And my question really being, and with, of course globalization is hard, so my, my, I was wondering to, to what extent the, that liberal, legal or global economic order uh, can continue to exist without one single power, be it US or China, really uh, controlling the system and, and, and ruling the world. Brilliant question. I, uh, the second part of your question, I think, is uh, ruled out. There will now be one global order if there is no one ruler. There is no such phenomenon under the sun. 
So probably you will see the balkanization of the system, regionalization of the system, yeah, with different currencies. And if this really happens, and it will start with a trade war or at least exchange of things. Uh, speaking about the uh, globalization itself and this weird, this wicked mechanism that we all all want good, but it go, goes out of our control, yeah. Because that's that's what happened, yeah. Mackinder, and that's the reason. It's London. He was the dean of British geographers, the creator of geopolitics, a phenomenal, fundamental person in shaping events in the 20th century and creating the thinking in the British mindset, decision-making mindset in American as well, Halford Mackinder. He, in describing the situation prior to the First World War, he admonished. The free trade is a recipe for war. It's only a matter of time. It's an illusion that free trade creates equal chances and equal prosperity. Someone will prosper more, someone will prosper less, and that will create a tension. I'm, I'm al almost qu quoting, okay? Because I, I read it two days ago when I'm writing my new book. And that will create a power struggle for the domination in who is setting those rules. It has to happen. And it's a naive policy of the sea-based power to provide the architecture for this free trade system, providing the navy and the people to service, to, pub, to deliver free public service, to police the waters. If it creates the decline of its own position, it's a suicide that has to be stopped because there is really power in decision making, in opening markets, and this crazy thing must stop. This is what Mark Kinder wrote in 1904, or, and he even he had a speech at Geographical Society. I, I, I might be wrong about the date and about the place, but, let's, but basically that's what he said. And we have to, the British Empire providing the service has to change it, because it's a world, it's a path to, not only to war, but also to, to, to decline. Let's compare those wor words with the situation nowadays and what Donald Trump is saying to Germans. Guys, you don't provide money for the military, for our Navy. So why do you want to use those lines of communications for your power, for your wealth? It's unfair. Give me the money. Because we provide it. I need to, to, I need to train my, my seaman. It costs money. It creates commitments, obligations far away from my continental United States. It doesn't pay. Plus, I, in this way, I open up markets for you guys, and you compete with me unfairly. And you guys Chinese as well. That's the same thing. So contribute or act fairly as we want, because we created the system. I don't know how people want to reconcile this tension. Another question. Hi, so you, you presented, uh, uh, coming back to the part, maybe, you presented like three options for war on the TC, and uh, well, I have a feeling that w towards which one you, you are like gravitating, but uh, what, so, so could you please say which of these three options is your favorite, and what scenario uh, would, would you see for this option to become reality? Yeah, your question reminded me that I, I forgot to answer in the Nina's question about Zappa. I'm sorry, my apologies. Uh, so let me get back to the Zapat exercises. So Zapat exercises uh, exactly are in line, in perfect line with what I said about the hard power or threat of use of hard power. 
if Poland and the eastern flank countries are landlocked countries far away from the power base of the sea power of the United States, you see Baltic Danish Straits, Germany that is hesitant, you need to project power through those places. So Zapata exercise showed that the correlation of forces and the, let's use the old Polish phrase, in the Polish Eastern War Theater, that's what Russians and Poles call it. And it's between the Dnieper, the Dwina, and the other river. And the, between the Baltic and the Carpathians. It's a huge one single battle space, historically. It doesn't matter that now political borders are different. The geography dictates the movement of troops like that, the channeling of movements, forward presence, screening, and battle network that has to be projecting forward, both ways. That's why it's such an unstable situation. And Zapata exercises are signaling to, to Warsaw, guys, you're on your own, change your mind. Actually, you're on your own, and not to mention the bolts, but who cares about them? They are too small to matter, but it's all between you and us. And where, where is the US? We can, in, in, under anti-access error denial umbrella, we can deny access to, you, to your place. And it me, that means that US doesn't have leverage on you. So you change your politi- policy. Change your policy. They keep signaling us and other countries on the eastern flank to change the main anchors of the policy. That's what, why, why you do exercises. That's how you do it, to prove someone else's weakness. That's what, that, that's, that was the reason of the Zapotex. And that, that's why NATO responded to show we are not weak. Look, look, look here, look there. And it's for the military analysts to analyze whether it was successful. Uh, I forgot your question, pardon me. Well, Zapotex is my, of course, three favorite options, thing. Three options for Paul. Uh, which one is your favorite and what would have to happen? What would have to happen to, for it to become reality? I don't have my favorite option. I tend to be an everyday balancer. So I would promote the interests of my country every single day uh, and every single tool and every single instrument that is on, on my hands to expand its power, prosperity of its people, whatever it takes. Okay? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any pre-ordered uh, strategy. Of course, we are dependent on the U.S. and its power projection. At the same time, I would be happy to see Polish business in the markets in Central Asia. And uh, for mostly, I would like to see the decline of Russia and collapse of this country. Because that takes away my main geostrategic concern. Because there is no escape from the competition on the belt between Baltic Sea and the Black Sea because of geography and the military aspect. Russia will always expand influence as long as it has capacity to do so. So it's always counter reaction to that. You cannot escape this dilemma if you are a Polish decision maker. You need to remove this thing from the Polish history. The only way to remove it is to collapse of Russia. And it happened after the brest litovsk peace treaty, after 1920, that happened. It happened also during great, you know, horrible times when we in, were installing people in Moscow, yeah, uh, on the thrones. And Russia is in decline. It tends to, uh, to collapse anyway from time to time. Or the world system that is giving us that is giving us security. And it used to be like that. That's that's why we're so happy and we're sending kids to London to universities. Okay. We were happy. Okay. We finally joined the West. And the West was at the apex of the world, right? Twenty five years ago. NATO, U.S., Supreme Power, West as economy. So we wanted to join. We wanted to be adopted. 
in security by US and NATO and we sort of were adopted. And in terms of economy decision making by, by Brussels, by you know, the West. It was an adoption. Let's call it straight. An adoption. Finally, we arrived at the final termina- terminal station of this long history of wars and deprivations in between the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea. But it turned out, turned out a few years ago that the history is back and we need to face it. And we are just re, uh, retooling our geostrategy. Who knows? Uh, I am of the opinion that uh, in the longer run, not in the long, but in the longer run, which means that it's shorter than long, uh, United States, if the rise of China continues, the United States will need Russia. Always. Historically, the dominant sea power sailing around Eurasia, like in Great Britain used to. <laughs> And if uh, providing that it's not threatened in its vital interest by the poten- potential of domination of the continental power of Russia, will ally with this power to counterbalance, to balance the rising power in the rimland of Eurasia. I hope it was quite it was clear. That's why. Remember the 19th century. First, Great Britain was scared of Russia seizing the, the Dardanelles Strait yeah? and uh, having power and influence over the Aegean Sea and the uh, Eastern Mediterranean that could put at risk Suez Canal and the land routes around Suez, later Suez Canal connecting, because that's what it was through Levant, Syria, and so on, to India, to the Indian Ocean, and then, you know, and then by ships to, the, to, to India. And that's why the Crimea War was about. And also later about this grand game in Eurasia, in, uh, in, in Asia, they were, Brits were afraid about the uh, intrusion into India. Okay. Yeah, through Afghanistan. The problem was that they were scared about the potential but once Germany a- entered the, the, the path to, 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 to become a continental threat, the Brits forgot about Russia because it didn't have the potential to, to, to do it. And also Brits even forbade, for, for, sorry, forgave, forgave United States that is rising. Because I don't know if you remember, but at the end of the 19th century, decision with whom to go to war whether the United States will, whether the United Kingdom will be challenging the rights of the United States or challenging the rights of Germany was being debated and United Kingdom and Great Britain, the Empire made the decision that okay we accommodate the rise of the United States because it's not a vital threat to our Asian colonies and about the European and the, and the home waters and the homeland as uh, Germans across the northern North Sea are. And the decision, geostrategic decision was made on one particular day to challenge Germany. And that 
uh, followed, uh, and with that followed the uh, decisions of alliances and different things and new, new, new fleets. Uh, my favorite, uh, Jackie Fisher, uh, Admiral, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the reformer of the Royal Navy, also adjusted the naval strategies to. Okay, I, I think I didn't answer your question. Sorry, but it seems to me that we are ending. Yeah. yeah we okay. <laughs> okay. But, uh, we will be heading uh, to a bar now, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to ask all the questions that all the remaining questions. So. Uh, oh, oh nice. <laughs> 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 we'll be going to the inn of court. So uh, just uh, yeah, like in five minutes or so. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.